before we start, <laughs> very sorry for the uh, technical glitch. We have to start a bit late. So, okay, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, International Educational Exchange is the most significant current project designed to continue the process of humanizing mankind to the point we would hope that men can live in peace, eventually even to cooperate in constructive activities rather than to compete in mindless contests of mutual destruction. We must try to expand the boundaries of human wisdom, empathy and perception. And there is no way of doing that except through education. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Rosina, and I'm the deputy of uh, director of uh, CAE. Here with me, we have the uh, uh, um, Dr. James Kaufman, the Messi executive director. Uh, in the meantime, we are waiting for Dr. Shukri to come in. And also, we have uh, Mr. Mukwin who is in charge of the sabbatical leave, so that if there's any question and answer, you can ask him, okay? Because for the academic staff, you need to have your sabbatical if you want to go on a Fulbright uh, Scholar Fellowship. So I'm so pleased to be with you today and to have the chance to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. James Kaufman, who has been involved in the field of international higher education as a student, professor, researcher, and administrator for 30 years. He earned his bachelor degree in philosophy from the University of California at Berkeley and his PhD in international development education from Stanford University. He then served as country director in Tunisia for ENIS, uh, an American educational and training organization. From 1996 to 2000, he was uh, Executive Director of Fulbright Commission in Islamabad, Pakistan. From 2000 to 2002, Dr. Kaufman served as the first Assistant Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences of Zayed University of Abu Dhabi, the UAE first women's university. He left Zayed University to return to his native California where he was Director of International Program Development at the University of California, Davis, until 2006. <coughs> Dr. David arrived in J Malaysia January 1st, 2008, so he must be here quite some time, six years really, to assume the Directorship of the Nation American Commission on Educational Exchange, Messi, in KL. When I talked to him, he was so well-versed about Malaysia, I said, you look like a local. So he said he eats more hot stuff than me. <laughs> he has been one of the main proponents of the uh, program for several years, and it is true stand out in administering the Fulbright program here in Malaysia. He has a great understanding of various grants and scholarship programs available for Malaysian citizens to further their studies in the US, and a great appreciation of educa education exchange and what it takes to turn nations into people, con contributing as no other form of communication can do to humanizing of international relations. He's eager to expand exchange program between Malaysia and the USA, and to see the number of Malaysian students in the USA rise to the high level of the 1970s and 1980s. Finally, he's also just a fascinating person and we are all in for the trip today. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. James Kaufman. Let's be here. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. I'm, I apologize for being late. Uh, Americans, as you know, are, have put a very high value on punctuality, and I'm very American. So I'm usually 10 or 15 minutes early to everything which makes my wife angry because she's always late. But um, another thing about Americans is that uh, we're not very as formal as Malaysians. I mean, I, I feel as if I'm talking to the president or prime minister here. This is, if it were up to me, we'd all come up front, sit on the floor and take our shoes off and talk about this. But I guess I have to respect the dignity of USM. Uh, because I do want this to be fairly informal. I, don't, I want especially to, to answer your questions. I don't want to tell you about things that you already know or tell you about things that don't interest you. I want to tell, I want, I'd like to find out what interests you the most and answer your questions. 
Uh, so I will go through a few slides here telling you uh, what Macy is and, uh, and about grants, but please, I'd like you to, I don't know, raise your hand or wave or something and ask a question uh, whenever you would like to. Um, first of all, before I even begin, I'd like to know, are you, most of you lecturers or some of you students or is it a mixture? What do we have here? How many people here are actually lecturers or staff or, okay, and how many are students? Okay, well, 50-50, roughly. Okay, because um, what I'm going to talk about will be postgraduate possibilities, either for masters or PhD, so I guess that could interest all of you. All right, first, I, I, I have to explain to you, I mean, I've had a very uh, overblown introduction of me, it, it was very well done, <clears throat> but I should explain to you, again, very briefly what Macy is and what Fulbright is, because there is a certain amount of confusion sometimes. Um, Oh, I have a, all right, there we are, come to the USA. You remember, I'm also in sales, I sell at USA, see, so, and I don't get a commission, but I do, my job is to promote higher education in the United States. Of course, you all have a choice, you can go lots of places, you can study in Malaysia or go elsewhere, my, my uh, I guess my job here in Malaysia is to try to promote study in the US because I think there's, a, there's some very good reasons. Um, very briefly, I'm going to tell you who, I, who we are, the Malaysian American Commission on Educational Exchange. I don't know if you can read it. Uh, we're by, by a national education commission. And that, by that I mean we are governmental. We're not private. We don't make any money on this. We are a, a governmental organization and the only one in Malaysia which is the two governments together, the Malaysian government and the United States government together run or fund and administer Macy, and they simply hired me to be the administrator, the, the director. Uh, there are 50 commissions like this around the world in 50 different countries. Uh, we are funded, as I said, by the two governments. Uh, Macy has a board of directors, half Malaysian, half Americans, that direct this. So it's very much the spirit of binationality, the two governments working together. The Ministry of Higher Education appoints people to the board of directors and the U.S. ambassador appoints the Americans. And I, of course, am, am here to administer this. Now, the, Mal the Malaysian American Commission on Educational Exchange, we're in KL, by the way, has two primary functions. All right, the first one is what we call Education USA. Simply, we are the official objective source of information on education, higher education in the U.S. You can go talk to certain commercial or private organizations and they can tell you things, but often they have a, a particular pecuniary interest or they're getting paid by this or that. We are simply the official, um, objective, impartial source of information, uh, much like you could say the British Council would be for the uh, UK, all right? Uh, and then the second thing that we do is administer a series of, or a collection of grants and scholarships called under the umbrella of Fulbright. I'm not going to talk today so much about Education USA. That, uh, that's, that part of our work, uh, you can look online, you can come to our office if you're in KL, but we do a lot of outreach and we talk to people about explaining uh, hi higher education, how you apply, the test you must take, how to choose, all of that. Uh, but we're not going to do that today. I'm going to talk more about this Fulbright part. And Fulbright, again, is a, uh, a scholarship program, I'll try to get through this without too much haste, established in 1946 by a certain senator, William Fulbright, very famous in, in the United States. Uh, every year, the US Congress appropriates money for the Fulbright program. And, and this, this year it's about $234.7 million and then foreign governments also give money. So your Malaysian government also contributes to this. So this is what funds this program. Uh, the goal is to, prom to promote international goodwill. Try to get the people of Malaysia and the United States studying, working, doing research together. And ultimately, what is the goal? Simply so the Malaysians and Americans understand each other better, appreciate each other better, and Senator Fulbright's vision was to this will reduce conflict and reduce the chances of war in the future because war was, is the worst thing that could ha can happen in this world. So 
he believed that the, if we get exchanges of scholars and students and researchers going back and forth, that this is going to be the best thing to, uh, to, to create harmony and understanding in the world. And I agree. Uh, it's now active in 155 countries in the world. In a way, you could compare very loosely the Fulbright program with the Rhodes Scholarship in the UK, although the Rhodes is, is focused on the Commonwealth countries, uh, whereas Fulbright is open to virtually almost every country in the world, with a few exceptions. Um, and then since the beginning, what, 300,000 Fulbrighters, we call them, have participated in the program. Some very famous Malaysians, I won't go into them, but you have some very uh, famous Malaysian politicians, business people, ac academic people, arts, artists, etc., who have gone through the Fulbright program, including your current minister of uh, tr uh, in industry and trade, uh, Mustafa Mohammed, ah, no, wait a minute, Mustafa Mohammed, huh? Uh, was one of our grantees in 1980, uh, and, and many others. And uh, as I say, they're about, since 1963, we have been here now 50 years. This is our 51st year in Malaysia. We've sent about 1,100 Malaysians to the U.S. and brought uh, almost 1,000 Americans to Malaysia. Because remember, this is a two-way program. Americans come here, Malaysians go to the U.S. Um, here, just a summary. But as you can see, the programs on the third one, it says there are student programs, there are scholar programs, teacher and administrator exchange, and there's also a thing called the Hubert Humphrey Fellowship Program, I'll explain. Um, so there's a, a whole uh, menu, I suppose, of scholarship and grants that are available. All right, I've gone through the purpose, and here are the goals. I think we could skip through that. Um, now, just I, I want to explain to you first, or just briefly show you what there is for Americans, because this is, of course, you're not American, so these would not be grants for you, but uh, you can get an idea of, of what we do to bring Americans in here, and this can also have uh, importance to your university here. As a matter of fact, we have an American Fulbrighter here at USM sitting among us right now. I guess, which, can you guess which one it is? You know, oh. <laughs> All right, He's, yeah, Dr. David Chapman is one of our Fulbright scholars that we brought in uh, this year. So we have, first we have Fulbright senior scholars like David, Dr. Chapman. These are people with PhDs who come to do research and or uh, teaching at the universities. Uh, we only give about five to six grants per year. We have what we call Fulbright senior specialists. Now these are Americans who come in for short periods, two to six weeks. And uh, this is a good program because it's uh, often a university might say, oh, we need some help in, uh, I don't know, developing a program or curriculum, curriculum development or doing some workshops with teachers or something or other. And we'd like some, a specialist to come in. Well, we can arrange that. And this is very, fairly quick. We can get someone in within about three months uh, on this. Uh, and we had a, a ridge, well, we had, up, I have up here up to 10 per year. Actually, that's been reduced now to six. But over these last few years, we don't get very many requests. And I'm always telling Malaysians wherever I go, listen, you want senior specialists to come in, almost free? Oh, yes, 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 we'd love that. Well, just simply send me a one-page description, scope of work, what you want the person to do, and the dates. Oh, yeah, we'll do that. And then no one, no one does it, and so the grants just go untaken. So. Uh, this year, I guess I've been nagging people enough that we've actually had six uh, this year coming in. I don't remember if we have one at USM. I can't, uh, offhand, I can't remember. We have some in UM and Unimas and different places. Uh, and then we have students who come in to do research as well. We have some right now uh, doing research on various things in Malaysia. Uh, that's also a very good program. And then we also have uh, what we call the Fulbright English an ETA program, which you may have heard of because they're in the newspaper all the time. Uh, this is a pet project of President Obama and Prime Minister Najib, so they get a lot of uh, attention. Uh, they have tea with the Prime Minister when they arrive, and then they, they meet with the President, that type of thing. But these, I have 100 of them right now in Malaysia, all over Malaysia, teaching in public schools. This is a, one of our, big, our most successful and highly, vi highly visible programs right now. Now, this does not involve you. I just wanted you to be aware of, the, of this. Um, let me see. 
there. Now, now we'll get into the scholarships for Malaysians. Now, first I'll start off by saying there's good news and there's bad news. All right, I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is that there aren't a lot of grants. The numbers, as you'll see, are not that great. The good news is there are not very many candidates, applicants for these. So just between you and me, this will be a secret, uh, there are not enough people applying. And sometimes if we have only, so let's say, five grants to give for Malaysians, we might end up with seven applicants. I mean, those are good chances, because usually one or two of those is no good anyway, so the other five are more or less. I mean, sometimes I have to ask people if they have a cousin or a sister that wants to go, because we, we don't, so th no, seriously, we are not getting enough good candidates. And I think the reason is, often people say, oh, Fulbright, it's prestigious, or oh, it must be very competitive. I couldn't get one, so I'm not going to bother applying. Well, everyone says that, and so no one applies, and then we, we, don't, we get very few. So don't tell anybody about this, so you can get these. But uh, it is true, though, that um, we don't get enough, and, and not enough good ones. So for that reason, do not feel, oh, no, it's too competitive for me. No, it isn't. Now, uh, I will go through quickly this list of, well, I have 10 different categories here. I have a, also have an information sheet with this, but you can also get this on our website. But some of them will be of interest to you because you are lecturers or students thinking maybe of doing a master's or PhD. Some of them may not be of interest to you, but I'm going to mention them because they may be of interest to someone you know, a family member, a friend, etc. because all of you know people. Um, and I'd like you to spread the word, if you can, that to people about these. Um, we'll go first to the scholar program. These are for people who already hold a PhD. So this is for people who want to do from three to eight months, usually it's, uh, we prefer three to six months, of research and lecturing in, the, in an American university. And you can read up here a little bit about what they are. They're usually research focused. Um, we have people in all different fields. Uh, we have about four to five. This year we gave five grants, I believe. Again, not that many applicants, okay. Um, These are simply the eligibility requirements. Um, as I say, all fields, more or less. So we, we have people in arts and sciences and social sciences and history and, and everything. So uh, please apply. Now, you might say, well, what are you really looking for? And this is always the question I get. What, what, what would be, what, what's going to get me that scholarship or that grant? Um, a lot of Malaysians think, well, if I can produce my long list of publications there that goes on for five pages, boy, that'll impress them and give me the grant. Well, that's not as important for us at all. Um, nor is, are your, or was your GPA when you were an undergraduate, or the fact that you got third place in a race when you were 13 years old. And I have people tell me that too. They, have, they produce all of these things to impress. What is it that we're looking for? We're looking for someone who has a project that is interesting, that's feasible, and that, then what, that you can simply lay out very clearly in one to two pages, this is what I want to do. I do not like to read, and I get them every year, long uh, proposals, most of which are in Greek letters of formulas and everything else. Um, can you explain your program, your project, s in simple English, exactly what it is you want to do, why it's important, and why you have to go to the U.S. to do it. And that's all we're really looking for is clarity. We want to know that you know what you want to do and you know why you want to go to the U.S. Now that may seem obvious, but it, actually many applicants don't think of that. Um, I've had people who say, yes, my, my project is to study uh, migration of uh, Indonesians to Malaysia over the last 100 years. All right, could be an interesting project, but my, what, what is the obvious question? Why do you want to go to the U.S. for that? Do it here. Now, that doesn't mean that, the, that I won't give a grant, but I want someone to be able to explain to me why. And actually, I have given a grant to somebody on a similar topic. And he went uh, last year or the year before on migration patterns in, in, in this region. Be and he, but he could explain the best archives in the world on this historical archives are at Cornell University. And that's why I want to be in Cornell. Okay, that's a good answer. Tick, you got your grant, all right? 
But what I'm saying is you have to be, you have to be very clear. Remember, I'm an American. I don't like to read long, long things. I like it to be short, sweet, to the point, and tell me why you want to do it, all right? So, uh, and as I say, we give them in all different fields, and we like to see a variety of fields. I send people in dance and in biotechnology, and I have a person there now on, uh, actually he works at Proton doing automotive design or something. I don't know, every, every possible thing it can be, all right? That's now a second category of grants we call the professional exchange program. That's very similar to the scholar program. It's for more mature people, but the, these are people who don't necessarily have a PhD. You don't need a PhD. You may have one, you may not. And they're not necessarily for academics. These tend to be for people, as I say, for example, the person who works at Proton in automotive design, uh, people who want to do a particular research project in the, in the US, these could be people from public and private sector. They could be managers, journalists we send, lawyers, these types of people. I have a lawyer going uh, in August on this, this grant here who's going to do freedom, a study of the Freedom of Information Act in America and how this can be applied to Malaysia, that type of thing. But this, this is also an interesting. Frankly, the man from Proton who wants to go to the US to study automotive design, my first question is, why would anyone want to study American automotive design? We have the worst cars in the world. But, I, but he was able to convince me, all right? I told him, go to Japan or something. No, 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 America for the, but the fact is, he had a good response, a logical reason. Oh, all right, well then do it, okay? Uh, sometimes it's good to study the worst case so that you can kind of see what to avoid, you know? Um, so we, anyway, we only give one grant like this per year, but actually we've only been getting one or two applicants for this. So again, now a few people are all academics, this may not be of interest to you, but again, you may have a brother-in-law or someone who's interested, all right? Um, here are the eligibility requirements. If you'd like, it must has, you must have at least a master's degree. Um, Oh, by the way, notice the deadlines on these. I forgot. At the end, I have the deadline for application for each one. They all tend to be August or September. Now, this is al almost one year in advance. That's the other thing. These, uh, these grants must be applied for well in advance. You cannot come to our office, as we often have, people who say, oh, I want to go to the U.S. Uh, in two months. What do you have? Sorry, that's already been all done for a long time, all right? So, this grant, for example, the deadline is in September. You can find out the exact date. I'm not sure if it's the 1st or the 15th, but you can look online on our website. It'll give you the information. So please start thinking about these things early because there is a long process. First of all, after the deadline, we have to do an, uh, an evaluation and do a selection and interviews. And then, uh, then we, uh, we have to go through placement process in the US, and that has to be done early, et cetera. So it takes a lot of, a lot of time, OK? Now, this might be more, more of interest for most of you, uh, those who would like to do a master's or a PhD in the US. Uh, we currently have uh, 10, I think, Malaysians on scholarship doing P a master's and PhDs in the US uh, on Fulbrights. Um, you can read up here. Our awards are partial grants. Now, by that, when I say partial, we give a certain, up to a certain sum of money Sometimes that's enough for the whole thing. It, uh, sometimes it's only part, enough for part of it and you must come up with some money out of, your, out of pocket. We, the reason I can't tell you exact that it's full or exact sum is that we, we don't know how much the university that you go to is going to cost share. See, often these universities, when, you're, when we place you, because you don't have to go through the process, we will place you. The university will say, okay, we'll provide this much cost sharing. Sometimes they provide a little bit, and the scholarship provides a little, and you have to make up the rest. Sometimes the university will provide almost all of it. So I've had recently one, actually she, she was from Penang, who got a full uh, scholarship to, to Harvard for four years. It was about 250,000 US. So you don't know. We never know in advance how much. So that what we, we negotiate, and then we will tell you roughly how you stand. But it's not necessarily full. Uh, as I say, we, play, we do the placement, which is a plus, because getting placed in an American university can be a lot of work. We will do that for you. Um, and then you can see the other parts here. Uh, and then the eligibility. 
We do have an age limit, 35. I can see that all of you are well under that. Um, you do not have to have taken a TOEFL or, a, or IELTS or GRE, anything bef when you apply. So a lot of people say, oh, I can't apply because I haven't taken an English test. No, you don't have to worry about that. You do that afterward. And if you, if you wait until afterward and we select you, then you don't have to pay for it, okay? It's free, so that's um, not necessary. But at a at certain point, you will have to take an English or a GRE or a GMAT um, to get placed. Um, you can see the other things. Again, the deadline, August 15th, would be for the, would be the deadline for you to get your application into us to, to start one year later, okay? Again, it may not seem like many grants, but uh, your chances are good. We also have a program, probably may not apply to anyone here, but maybe again, you, ha you have someone in your family or friends who is an English, a young English teacher or an English graduate who either has not started teaching yet or has only got a year or two of teaching and may want to go to the US for a year, fully paid, where you will where that person will uh, teach BM at the university in the US and at the same time take courses in whatever, English, uh, uh, pedagogy, education, whatever. Uh, it's an excellent program because future English teachers in Malaysia can learn a lot about teaching English by teaching their own language to English speakers. It, it, it really gets you thinking, it, 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 it hones your skills. So. The people who participate in this every year come back really charged up. They love it. They always have a great experience. So that this, if, you have, if you know of anybody in this category here, uh, we don't give many of these, but we, again, we don't get a lot of uh, applications for it. These are, I don't know if there's an age limit. Yeah, there's an age limit of 29. Usually the people we send are about 24, 25. Um, now, here you can see the deadline, a August 8th. All right, oh, by the way, all of these, vi uh, these pro uh, programs we send you on, you go on a J what is called a J-1 visa, uh, which is not a, nor a normal student would go to the US on an F-1 if you're paying your own. Uh, this is a J-1, meaning you're sponsored by the government. And uh, the, the one condition of the J-1 is that you must uh, return to your country for two year period before you can think about emigrating to the US, okay? You can always visit the US, that's not a problem, but emigrating is what I'm talking about. So if you do get one and you go, you have to know that if you fall in love over there and you want to get married, and the, you, you're gonna still have to come back, you know? And don't laugh because every, well not every year, but very often I have people who say, oh, I go, I got married when I was over there, and my husband, I wanna stay with my husband and I don't wanna leave. I say, well, sorry, that's a condition that the government will not yield on. So my, just my advice is you know, don't fall in love while you're there. <laughs> but, but I can't control that. Um, now we have another program which is an excellent program, the Hubert Humphrey. This is the one that Mustafa Muhammad went on when he was young. Um, we look for people who are mid-career professionals, mid-career, between, well, as young as maybe 30, 32, up to maybe 45, 48, people who still have something left in them uh, afterward, um, but who work in public or private sectors and they look as if they're maybe future leaders. Uh, this is a program where you go to the US for one year. It's not a degree program, but it is a v an excellent professional development and networking possibility for people. We send people in fields, well I'll show you the fields, but it's, it's very good, you, you go to the US, you're stationed at a university where you can follow, you know, take courses, but you can also attend conferences and network with people in your field and uh, even do internships. It's really a good program. Um, these are the eligible fields here. And so far we, for Malaysia, I've sent people in journalism. For example, the one I sent in journalism t three years ago uh, was, you know, she was a good journalist here, not really noticed. I think she may be with Malaysia Kini, I'm not sure, but she, she got an internship in, in, when she was there in uh, Al Jazeera in Washington, and they liked her so much now, she's, they gave her a job and she's in Doha uh, working for Al Jazeera. All right, it was great for her. We also have people going in drug prevention or, uh, 
human rights. We have the one I'm, one I'm sending this year now is working on uh, refugee rights in Malaysia, that type of thing. But anyway, you can see all the different types of things. Excellent program. So if you, again, if you know someone, non-academic, but who would like something like this, again, the eligibility, you can read this through. Um, all the person needs is really a, a, a bachelor's degree minimum for this. Now, this is a program I particularly like, International Leaders in Education for secondary school teachers. Some of you may have a spouse or somebody, a friend who is a secondary teacher. Every year we send people, secondary teachers to the U.S. for one semester. They go from January to May each year. They are at a university campus where they, again, will take courses of their choice. But they also work half-time teaching in an American secondary school. And they, they, it's a great program. They really, people come up with a lot of new ideas when they come back. Also, there are possibilities for funding after you come back to Malaysia. So you can do programs here with, for Malaysian uh, teachers. Uh, this is, I think, one of our best programs. Um, again, if you, ha if you know anyone who, w who is a secondary teacher who speaks English uh, here who would be interested in going for a semester, usually the ministry all, uh, will grant leave with pay. Uh, we haven't had a problem with that. Uh, so we, uh, we just love this program. Let me see, do we have eligibility? There you go. Uh, now this is a program that starts in January of every year. So for that reason, our deadline is April prior to that. So that would be, it's just passed now, unfortunately, for January 2015. But for the next year, it would be in April. Now this one is for undergraduates. This is the only thing we do for undergraduates. Um, so you people are probably, any, uh, there are some undergraduates here probably, but you may be a little bit too advanced. This is for people who want to do one semester or two semesters in an American university, all, everything paid, but you start your studies here, say at USM or anywhere, you go to the US, you do a semester or two, and then you return here and you finish your degree here. So this is not for a degree in the US, but an excellent program. It's called, we call it UGRAD, although it's Global Undergraduate is the name of it. Otherwise, it goes by the acronym UGRAD, U-G-R-A-D. Uh, these people uh, really have a good time. They, they are, we're looking for people who have probably finished one year here, possibly two years. Uh, people who want an American experience for some reason or other and, want, and can explain why they want to go. They earn credits in the U.S. Usually the universities here will accept these credits and transfer them. But that's not my business. That's the business of the university. Um, they usually come back again, very changed. I see these people, wh when I interview them before they go, they all, you know, they have their heads down and they answer, yes, no, no. And then uh, they go off to the U.S. and do their semester or two, and then they come back for a briefing and they walk in the door, hey, how you doing? And they, you know, they've, all of a sudden they've opened up and the, the, the confidence level has gone up very high, and they say, oh, I had the greatest time of my life. As a matter of fact, I got five girlfriends back there, and I've got, I'm going to go back. And anyway, they all have, a, 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 I can just see them blossoming uh, because of this experience. Getting out on their own, independent, away from, the, the same old thing in a way, get a lot of new ideas. Um, a lot of them then go on to, uh, they want to go back and do master's degrees or whatever and they do that. But this is a great ex first initial experience in the US um, as an American student. So again, if you know of anybody who might be interested in this, um, here are the eligibility, they have to be no more than 24 because we want only younger people. And anyone who has completed at least one semester here and will have at least one semester left when they come back. That's it. And we're also, we give, you notice at the bottom, we give preference to non-elite students. We, we do take a look at people who we think probably would not be able to ever do this uh, normally because of financial reasons. Uh, so they'd get a little preference. But anyway, uh, the deadline for this is December. And that would be to go either in the following August, which would be, what, eight months or so later. So uh, 
talk to your friends and family if you know of anybody. We also, this is, uh, this is just something I want to mention. It's uh, for those who have, uh, maybe again, not for you, but if you know of anybody who is applying right now to enter an American university, first year undergraduate, there is a scholarship program that we, we administer. It's not our money, but we administer for the American Malaysian Chamber of Commerce where they give a $20,000 scholarship every year to a, to a student. So uh, again, if you know of anyone who uh, looks, uh, maybe an 18-year-old who will be going to the US uh, this coming year, uh, August or September, th this is a, a chance for some additional funding if they need it. So here are the uh, requirements. This is for people who have already been admitted to a university and are going to go. <coughs> The last thing, and I think you should take notice of, of this. This is um, a grant program that is not run by Macy. We do not administer this. But the reason is, I'm telling you, is that we are, our job is to at least promote it and publicize it for the East-West Center. That is at the University of Hawaii in the, Uni in the United States. This is for master's degree or PhD study. Uh, one of the people we sent on this program years ago is, is a man you all know, Prime Minister Najib. He, he had one of these. Um, the reason I'm talking to you about this is that they tell us all the time, the East-West Center, we have these scholarships for students to do these masters, and we're not getting any Malaysian applicants. What's wrong with the Malaysians? We get lots of applicants from Philippines and Indonesia and Singapore and Thailand, but nobody from Malaysia. Why? We have, it's almost, we, we're looking for people from Malaysia. So if, you, if you're interested in pursuing your studies, excellent, excellent institution, uh, your chances are probably good. You'll get noticed. Oh, oh, a Malaysian, finally. You see, I don't know why, uh, maybe the word is not out, but this is uh, a good uh, a program for people. As you can see, they like people who, uh, who want to do studies related to Asia, East Asia and the Pacific. Very loosely though, it could be economics, environment, uh, governance, politics, uh, sociology, lots of different things. I don't think that they would take, they're as interested in people in the hard sciences and engineering, but social sciences. And last but not least, as Macy has some funds, we call it the Opportunity Fund, uh, for people who are interested in maybe exploring the idea of applying to an American university, but maybe they have problems with the money, uh, like paying for the TOEFL test, paying for the GRE, paying for various things, application fees, we can provide you with that money. This is not competitive. This is not a thing that you have to compete with others for. It's simply if you look as if you are serious about this and you are needy in any way, we can help you uh, pay for this. And we give, we've been giving out thousands and thousands of dollars, U.S. dollars like this, paying for things. So it, it helps, uh, especially if you, as I say, if you don't have a lot of money. Or if you have to go take a test, a GRE, and you have to go to KL, not only would we pay for the GRE, but we could also pay for your transport to KL and back, that type of thing. It's trying to make things uh, a little bit easier for you. Um, for this, uh, again, look at our website or contact Ms. Doreen John, you can see at the bottom, at, at Macy. Um, and then, this is our website, and as you see the name of Ms. Uh, Kali Subramaniam, she is the program officer for all scholarships for Malaysians. Um, and our telephone number, but just go online and you can get all of this. Now, um, I, I like to talk a little bit about one thing called university rankings, uh, because I've never been in a country, I've been, I've been in a lot of countries in, the, in this world, I've worked in a number of them, I've traveled in many, uh, I've never seen a country like Malaysia where rankings are so important. Uh, everybody here knows rankings. I, I'm, I, I've never seen, I, I'm, I was blown away the first time I came here. I can go into some kampong area in the, in the jungle where nobody speaks English, but they all know the rankings in the U.S. I think, how do they do this? Even Americans don't know these things. But they know the ra rankings, and then they get so involved. Well, the rankings can be very, very, uh, I think they can be confusing and not give you the right perspective on, on it. So if you are thinking of universities, I like to show 
that first of all, there is no official ranking. People like to talk about QS rankings or the Shanghai Chao Tong uh, or the US News and World Report, et cetera. All right, there are different you know, private enterprises that have their rankings and they use different criteria and they have their reasons for doing so, but rankings can be uh, misleading, all right? So do not give too much importance to them. Um, they're not necessarily objective or accurate. Uh, depend, they all depend on the criteria, as I'll show you. And there are some of the top universities in the US now who are actually refusing to participate in the rankings game because they don't like the way it's done and they don't like what the, the uh, uh, per perception that's giving to people. Oh, I don't know if you can read that. It may, may be too small. Um, but this is, I just like to use this as an example from the 2012 rankings. Uh, and you have on the left, I don't know if you can see it on the left, read it. These are the, Lond the, the QS, London Times rankings of the 20 top universities in the world. And then on the right, you have the Shanghai Jiao Tong University right, for the same year of theirs. And what's interesting is how different they can be. Up, at, up toward the top, not too much, but you can see, I don't know, University College London, uh, Imperial College, fourth and sixth in this ranking. Over here, missing, not even there. And, and, and I, you know, I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong, but simply that the criteria that one uses and also maybe the national perspective because QS of course comes out of the UK so they will probably give higher rankings to UK institutions. Uh, and then if you can look on others, the Dutch do rankings, Americans, you'll find that they can vary widely. So don't start saying, well, you know, I, I want to go to such and such a university, it's fifth in the world. Well, yeah, maybe on one ranking it's fifth, on another it could be 25th. Uh, and th so this can kind of give you an idea that these things are, are not, as objective as you may think. One thing you will notice, however, and this I'm, I'm going to put my American hat on again, is that if you look at the uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong, these are the Chinese doing it, not the Americans, 17 of the top 20 universities in the world are in the US. 17 out of 20. Even the UK, uh, the, the Brits, you know how they can be, uh, they, they have 13 of the 20 uh, uh, being in the US. So it, what you can see here, though, is the, still the very high standing, high esteem, regardless of who's doing it, of US universities. Uh, however, be careful because these, all of these rankings look primarily at postgraduate uh, criteria, publications, and, and even things of that nature, which don't necessarily equate to quality of classroom education, for example. And I'll I won't belabor this too much, but if you look, US national rankings, Again, look at the, uh, I don't know, hope you can read it, it looks small, but uh, what's interesting in this is if you look at the US News and World Report, you have them with the, the typical usual suspects of Harvard, Princeton, Yale, et cetera, going down. Forbes magazine came out with its top ranking. And look, at, look what they've got up top. Number two, Williams College. Do you know Williams College? All right, see, there we go. So that's what I'm trying to point out. You don't know Williams College, but yet Forbes Magazine calls it the second best institution in the whole United States. Better than Stanford, Chicago, Yale, Harvard. Now why is this? Because the Forbes looks at the undergraduate experience, different criteria, so they, and, and I, I agree that if you are an undergraduate, you may find that you get a much better quality education at a school like Williams or uh, scripts or schools that you've never heard of than you would at, say, a place where I went, UC Berkeley, for example. I, was, I did my undergraduate at UC Berkeley. I would probably not recommend it mo for most undergraduates simply because it's very, very focused on postgraduate studies. I probably would have had a, a better undergraduate experience at a school like Williams or that type of thing. So, Again, I'm not trying to push a particular ranking or anything. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how these things are not particularly objective. And then, so when you choose, if you decide to apply and you want to go to university, you have to choose more what is the fit for you. And particularly, the, if you want to look at rankings, I know you can't, have, you know, you're Malaysian, you can't, have, you can't uh, stay away from them. It's like a drug, you know, for Malaysians, the rankings. So at least choose your drug well. Look at rankings within your field. If you are in chemistry, well, don't look at these overall, right? Look at the rankings for chemistry postgraduate programs. 
that'll give you a little bit better. But still, you have to look at other, other uh, aspects of, what, of, of the programs of the universities, why you want to go one place as to another, and, and it, it can get down to your particular specialization. If you really want to look at, I don't know, nanotechnology, and you, you, then you want to start getting into and where the best people are in nanotechnology, and, and, and that you get not by looking at rankings lists, but by looking at uh, pub bibliographies of publications where you see who, do you, who are these Americans that are writing articles on the thing that really interests me so much, and who is doing the cutting edge work, and where are they teaching, and wh which institutions, and following it that way. Do a little research on your part. Do not just go to the rankings. I've got to go to Harvard. And they, as a matter of fact, I have people in my coming to the office practically every day saying, I, I, I want to go to the U.S., but it must be Ivy League. All right, Ivy League. Okay, Ivy League. Yes, yeah, I have to go to an Ivy League school like Stanford. Well, Stanford is not Ivy League. And I said, what is that? And I asked them, what is Ivy League? And they, I don't know. They don't even know what it is. And I, I would venture to say there's probably not one person in here who can tell me what the Ivy League schools are. But there's this idea in your head, Ivy League, Ivy League. Uh, whereas Ivy League is an outdated, very, very outdated notion and that you should start, and, and, and not a, a particularly good one for choosing your institution, okay? For example, if you want to do engineering, or I would not advise you to go to Harvard. I mean, I would advise you to go to other places where the engineering programs might be much better. Go to Caltech. Again, maybe Caltech you've never heard of, but Caltech usually comes out in the top five rankings in the world in, in engineering, no matter who does it. So anyway, you have to look at issues like that, and we can help you, okay? Just as this is a quick thing here, I, I looked at the figures for, two th oh, actually this is 2000, yeah, 2012, where are people studying? These are international students, foreign students. Where are they studying in the U.S.? I just have the top 20 so you can get an idea which institutions are attracting the most international students. It isn't, again, necessarily because they're the best. You do have some of the best, but it's because they, some of them simply uh, are, uh, are more interested in attracting students, some of them, some of them from, from abroad, some of them have strong programs in engineering, for example, that attract a lot of people. But this is where they're going. As you can see, you go down the list, you can see where they are. Um, sometimes it's good to be at an institution where there are a lot of in uh, foreign students as well. I don't know. But that, that again, is just simply uh, a question of chaste, taste. And th this is the last thing, is what are people studying? What are the international students studying in the U.S.? And here's just a quick breakdown um, of the fields. And you can you see business, man, business and management and engineering always tend to dominate in the, in the fields of, of study uh, t undertaken by international students, but you have everything up there. All right, now I think that's my last one. Yes, that is. So I'm not, uh, what I'd like to do is ask you if you have any questions. First of all, are there any foreign people in here? Anybody who's not Malaysian? Ah, all right. Well, I don't know, Mr. Chapman, you're almost Malaysian. Yes, sir, where are you from? Yemen, okay. Uh, I, was just, I just asked that because Macy uh, is, serves Americans and Malaysians by our mandate only because we are funded by the two governments. If you are from another country like Yemen, you have to go through the Fulbright program in Yemen. And there is, the Fulbright program in Yemen has very similar programs, Fulbright, but we cannot, unfortunately, we cannot give you a grant. But um, oh, one other thing too I should add uh, is that if those of you who are going to do a PhD in the U.S., a Fulbright grant is great. Oh, yes, if you can get that. But don't think, and this unfortunately is very common here, the idea is I cannot apply to the U.S. until I get some type of 